Hi students, welcome to Science Extension and Module 1, The Foundations of Scientific Thinking. This is video number four. We're going to be looking at the principle of parsimony or Occam's razor. What we need to do in this video is to assess parsimony or Occam's razor and its influence on the development of science. So as we go through this video, we're going to have a look at the law of parsimony or the principle of parsimony, uh, otherwise known as Occam's razor or just simplicity. We're going to look at some of the applications of parsimony and how we apply Occam's razor in science and some of the critiques of this particular method. So where does this law or principle break down? As I mentioned in a previous video, I want to try and give you a little bit of an idea of some of the sources that have been used to generate some of the quotes and also some of the material that's been used in this video. Uh, we're continuing to use the very short introduction to the philosophy of science. I think that's a great book to sort of get you in and get going. Uh, Theory and Reality is a much more complex book with a lot of um, important concepts established and dealt with in a lot more detail. And also one that I've found just recently, Life is Simple, which is a really interesting book looking at William of Ockham and his razor and exactly a lot of the historical context behind um, the application of Ockham's razor, where it came from and how it can be applied. So an interesting little book to have a look at. There's one or two additional online sources of material, some of those which we'll be looking at in more detail in class. So let's get to it. In his book, Life is Simple, McFadden identified that Occam's ruthless application of the principle to dismantle much of medieval philosophy became so notorious that three centuries after his death, the French theologian Libet Fredmont coined the term Occam's razor to refer to William's preference for shaving away excess complexity. Occam's razor is a reasoning tool that's used to select a theory from a set of competing theories that are available to explain some natural phenomenon. Occam's razor is attributed to the 13th century English friar William of Occam. There are two statements in his works that typify Occam's razor. Firstly, plurality must never be posited without necessity, and what can be explained by the assumption of fewer things is vainly explained by the assumption of more things. Statements like these have been attributed to other thinkers, including Aristotle, Sir Isaac Newton, Sir Bertrand Russell, and Albert Einstein. To look at a couple of these ideas of simplicity, it's been attributed to Aristotle that we may assume the superiority, other things being equal, of the demonstration which derives from fewer postulates or hypotheses. In his Principia, one of Newton's rules was we are to admit no more causes of natural things than such as are both true and sufficient to explain their appearances. And certainly Newton put this into practice when he looked at the laws that applied to moving bodies as applying to all moving bodies anywhere in the universe. Albert Einstein himself in 1934 insisted that the grand aim of all science is to cover the greatest number of empirical facts by logical deduction from the smallest possible number of hypotheses or axioms. That word razor was an analogy to the process of shaving away unwanted arguments when deriving conclusions. In his really good book, In the Study of William of Ockham, McFadden wrote, simplicity is not just a tool of science alongside experimentation. It is as central to science as numbers are to mathematics or notes to music. Indeed, in the final analysis, simplicity is, I believe, what separates science from the countless other ways of making sense of the world. In modern science, Occam's razor has been replaced with the term simplicity or parsimony. You find a large number of sources that quote the principle or law of parsimony, which states that other things being equal, simpler explanations are generally better than more complex ones. Scientific explanations refer to those that make fewer assumptions in their formulation and result in fewer exceptions. The criterion of simplicity is quite difficult to explain, and when scientists are trying to develop explanations of some phenomena, they devise a number of alternative hypotheses. Sometimes, after testing those hypotheses, there may be more than one plausible hypothesis for a particular phenomenon. These are the situations in which Occam's razor, or the principle of parsimony, might be useful. Godfrey Smith, in his book, Theory and Reality, 
pulled out the ideas around what might be regarded as four key goals of this concept of simplicity or parsimony. First, fewer or more entities might be used in a theory. Alternatively, perhaps what matters is not fewer entities, but fewer kinds of things. Perhaps it doesn't matter if you add more planets to your picture, if you already have planets, but you might want to do as much as possible with planets before you add something else. This was a principle upon which the planet Neptune was found because of some um, observations around Uranus that didn't seem to fit. So we could have thrown out the theory or postulated another planet that might have been causing some of those unusual measurements for Uranus. Third, we might prefer less complicated over more complicated causal arrangements. This can conflict with other kinds of simplicity, and you might be able to tell a story with a small number of causal factors, but only if they're arranged in a very elaborate way. And fourth, a simpler theory might be more compact when written down, though this will depend on what language is chosen. And it's hard to see it as an important matter, except as a guide to other kinds of simplicity. How then are we going to apply the law of parsimony? Well, one example of a parsimonious reasoning is the selection of the heliocentric model of the solar system. We've looked at the shift, this very, very important shift from the geocentric to heliocentric idea about the universe. Was the sun the center of our universe? or was the Earth. The heliocentric model holds that the Sun is at the center of the solar system and encircled by the planets that revolve around it. And it's a model that was first proposed by the Greek astronomer Aristarchus of Samos in the third century BC. It fell out of favor and Ptolemy's geocentric model where the Earth is considered the center of the solar system and the universe became the established model of planetary movement. However, there were problems with the geocentric model from the outset. The model couldn't account for a number of things, including the apparent retrograde motion of Mercury and Venus. Retrograde motion is an idea that basically describes that when a planet is making a loop and you see it making a loop, it seems to stop moving forward in part of its cycle and appears to go backwards before it moves forwards again. To explain these contradictions, Ptolemy introduced the concept of epicycles or circles within circles. He loved circles. And he introduced these into the orbits of the planets with the Earth offset from the center. Despite its complexity, there were errors in its prediction of planetary positions by several degrees or by an angular distance larger than the diameter of the full moon. The heliocentric model, which was revived in the 16th century by the Polish astronomer Copernicus, did not include the idea of epicycles. Yet it was able to account for all of the predictions of the geocentric models. In that respect, the heliocentric model was more parsimonious or simpler than the geocentric model. Subsequent astronom astronomical data confirmed the validity of the heliocentric model of the solar system. If you look at these two figures, the figure on the left shows the geocentric model of the solar system and the figure on the right, the heliocentric model. The inset below each model shows the transit of a planet in retrograde motion against a backdrop of stars. So that apparent backwards motion of the planet in relation to the stars that it kind of sits in front of prior to um, re-establishing, if you like, its motion within its orbit. The geocentric model required the additional complexity of epicycles to account for the retrograde motion, while the simpler heliocentric model did not. It became so complex as we discovered more and more about the universe that Ptolemy's model just became epicycles and epicycles and epicycles, and it just became a very complex way of trying to explain something. So it was a problem that was calling out for parsimony. It was a problem that was calling out for a simpler explanation. Like the model of the universe, there are other examples in science where parsimony has resulted in the acceptance of simpler theories, including areas like thermodynamics, the caloric theory versus the mechanical theory of heat, and also in quantum theory, the Bohr model of the atom versus the quantum physical models. Parsimony is also used in evolutionary biology in the study of cladistics to establish phylogenetic or evolutionary relationships between groups of organisms. This is an area that's continued to grow, often on the basis of morphometrics, the measurement of different uh, characteristics of different organisms, in order to try and create some sort of 
um, evolutionary relationships between different types of organisms and perhaps to work backwards to show possible common ancestries. If you look at the figure shown, the most parsimonious evolutionary model that could explain the relationship between three species of hummingbirds is the simplest one, which suggests fewer genetic changes required to produce the observed evolutionary changes. In this example, two separate models are shown for the evolution of red feathers in two species of hummingbirds. The model on the left requires 200 genetic changes, while the one on the right requires only 70. Thus, all else being equal, the model on the right is more parsimonious than the one on the left, and hence, it's the preferred model. It identifies common ancestry for these uh, two diverse species, but it presumes something that happened only once in the lead up to this particular div divergent point of, of evolution. Parsimony is not without its critics, and the concept of parsimony is not universally accepted. Occam's razor can only be applied when experimental evidence or observations support the competing ideas and when those ideas differ in their complexity. If the competing ideas are equally valid and complex, Occam's razor cannot be and often is not applied. There's many instances of simpler theories being proven wrong or inaccuracies with subsequent evidence. One example is Newton's law of universal gravitation. It's a simpler explanation for planetary motion in comparison to Einstein's theory of general relativity. However, Einstein's general relativity is more accurate. One example of this is that general relativity was able to provide an explanation for Mercury's unusual orbit around the Sun, which couldn't be explained by Newton's law of gravitation. Mercury's elliptical orbit around the Sun changes over time. Einstein explained this phenomenon using his laws of general relativity which couldn't be explained with Newton's law of gravitation. So when considering whether or not to apply the principle of parsimony, evidence is critical, but other factors may also be important. The degree to which a hypothesis is testable, the breadth or depth of explanation offered by the hypothesis or idea, the relationship between a hypothesis and the existing ideas, and the ability of a hypothesis to generate new areas for empirical study. In concluding, Godfrey Smith wrote, in many situations, it's good to start by working with simple theories and see how they fare, because this is more likely to get us to the truth in the end. Thanks for watching.